Right. Uh, good evening. You're welcome to another edition of uh, the Candid Podcast. Um, today, we, uh, we have uh, someone special with us, and um, usually, we usually discuss amongst ourselves, but you know, recent we've been inviting guests onto the show. Uh, so today we have Faye for me. Um, Faye is an economist and an accountant that works uh, in the United Kingdom in financial services uh, industry. Uh, Faye is based somewhere around London uh, with his wife and two kids. Um, apart from his um, apart from the fact that he works in financial services, uh, Faye is also just written a very, in my opinion, what, I, what in my opinion is a very important book. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the book is Formation, Making of Nigeria from Jihad to Amalgamation. Um, so I have with me today Mondiu and I have Stanley as well. And we're usually a bit more than this book. The rest couldn't make it today. So um, I'm going to start, get right to it, um, by asking for you, one of the things that, when, so, so when I first, when you first announced this book, right, one of the things that, first, one of the questions that first came to me was, why did you decide, um, to write on political history rather than, I mean, finance. By the way, um, just to just to take it back, uh, Faye is a co-author of the book. He's not the only author of the book. I wanted to clarify that. Um, we co-authored the book. Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have the author on the show. But can I just ask Faye, why is it, I mean, both yourself and the co-author uh, are, Financial uh, finance guys. The question that naturally came to me was, to be honest, when, when I heard you were going to come up with the book, the first, thing, the first question that came to me was, why political history? Why not, you know, like some history on, on some industrialists from that time or something? It's a good, <clears throat> sorry, it's a good question. Um, to be honest, I think we walk backwards to the answer. So. Paula and I, um, you know, we've been friends for some time. We met, you know, on, on Twitter, and then we got close um, to the point where, uh, whenever I was in London, he'd come to my, he'd come around, we'd hang out. When I was in Nigeria, I'd go to his house for a hangout, you know. And we, I mean, we just used to discuss Nigeria in general. And over time, I discovered that Fola had. Um, he had invested a lot of time and effort in understanding Nigeria's history. Obviously, I mean, I've read some Nigerian history, but it was nowhere near what he had done. So talking about actually spending a lot of money on buying <clears throat> every Nigerian history book you can imagine. You know, so he, he, he's almost like a collector of Nigerian history in that sense. So there was a particular day when, and, you know, he came to London, we were in, um, uh, we, were, we just hung out and I just thought, you know, at the end, I, I mean, when we finished the conversation, we're talking about Nigerian history as well, that they were discussing one book, uh, which he had recommended for me to read because my my grandfather popped up in the book somewhere. So, you know, after we finished hanging out, I just sent him a message like, look, maybe we should write a book together on Nigeria. You know, I've always wanted to write something, you know, but I just thought, hang on a minute, you have a friend here who is like a real resource who really has taken time out to try and understand Nigeria and figure it out that, man, why not? Why don't we do something together? And it was just a, an idea I just threw out in the air that, you know, you know, just think about it. Something I feel like, you know, you have put in a lot of work, a lot of effort and a lot of time in understanding. I have done a bit, but I mean, I've not come anywhere close to where then but you know maybe we can collaborate you know somewhere and you know he, he liked the idea and we just thought okay you know where can we really add value because at the end of the day both of us like you said we're in finance mm. if we come out with a book you know we want to at least be able to say okay let's add value you know we're not going to just write something that Maxi Olun has written you know so and Maxi Olun had covered the post-independence period pretty well very, very well. And he just thought that as while we're writing, apparently he was also writing as well. So we just thought, you know, the 
pre-colonial period in Nigeria. It's almost like a blank slate. Most people don't know much about it, you know. People know that, okay, the British came, you know, and colonized Nigeria, and then we know what happened after independence. And all. But actually, what happened in... I remember, you know, growing up, I, used to, I mean, my parents used to buy a Guardian, you know, and I just, you see that quote, Dan Fodio's quote, you know, conscience is an open conscience. wound. It's an open wound. Yeah, only truth. <laughs> and, you know, and it just, you know, I just thought, I mean, somebody called Dan Fodio. You know, there's just one Dan Fodio person who said that. But, you know, over time, I get to realize that actually this guy was, is whatever you might think, you know, he was one of the most important people in the history of Nigeria in the sense that he was the one who kickstarted this whole project of consolidating all these different lands. You know, he only did it up in the north, but consolidating all the different parts and together to start to form what we might say was the first draft of today's Nigeria. You know, so I just thought, you know, I mean, we can add, and then we thought, hmm, you want to write about pre-colonial Nigerian history? Where are you going to get material from? You know, Nigerian histories. But then when we started to dig, we found out, okay, I mean, there might be a book, it might cost 200 pounds to get it, but the story is there. You know, there might be another book that is completely out of print, and there are many like this, you know, they was written in 1960s, 1940s, you know, but the material is there, you know, so if we put in the effort, we can actually, you know, what we wanted to do, we can add value, you know, so and that, and that was how we, we, we came to it, to think that, okay, you know, two people who work in banks want to write a book on Nigerian history, you better do it at least, at the very least, we want somebody to pick up the book and say, oh, okay, I didn't know that you know, uh, previously. And somebody, we cannot waste people's time, you know, they are historians in Nigeria, yeah. you know, but we at least just to be able to say, okay, and to speak to our own generation as well. You know, the Nigerian, Nigeria is an interesting country in the sense that, you know, obviously we all know that the vast majority of the population are under 30, maybe 70% or more. And then when you combine that with the fact that we don't really teach history, it just means that you have to keep refreshing you know, otherwise, because every time you have a new generation, they are, they are becoming more and more disconnected from the past and you are not teaching them, you know. So we wanted to sort of achieve that in terms of refreshing the story for, for the current generation, you know. And at least if somebody comes in 10, 20 years time, you know, just try and do the thing again, at least maybe hopefully our book can be a starting point and then for them to expand uh, on it. But, but, you know, this story is important that you know, to understand where Nigeria became. Nigeria is a British creation. At the same time, it's not just a British creation. You know, there were so many things that happened, you know, before the British came, whereby you can still see those patterns in, in, in today's Nigeria. So we wanted to shine a light on that period, which we felt that, you know, a lot of the current, the vast majority of Nigeria's population today, which is young people, are kind of disconnected from. You know, so and maybe spark an interest and be able to, like I said, add value in the sense that when somebody picks up the book, they learn new things that they didn't uh, previously know. So yeah, so that's how the story came about. Wow, wow, that's fantastic stuff. Um, so um, another question. I mean, I'll ask one more question and then I'll let I'll let the other guys go. Um, so you talked about you know how you got together, you bought a few books. How, how long did this process take? Like. How long from, from that conversation you had to what we have in my hands, what I have in my hands today, how long did that take? So that's interesting. I mean, the, the actual writing part is the easy part. That one didn't, okay. it didn't take, I mean, you can write, the, the actual writing is probably maybe like one or two months, you write everything. But the research, like you said, is, uh, was pretty, so I think that we could probably say that took about 18 months. Now we're lucky because it's two people. You know, okay. So well, when you read the book, you I mean, maybe you might have figured it out, but in broadly, you know, and it's not neat, it's not a, a clear thing, but broadly, I wrote the North, Fola wrote the South, you know, and then we, okay. and then we, and then we kind of funny in a, in, a, in a funny sense, you know, we kind of met in Nupe. So we wrote half of Nupe, uh, you know, so we both wrote half, half of uh, Nupe. I wrote half of it, well, maybe like slightly over half of it, and then he wrote the remaining half of it as well. So, okay. so yeah, so it, it was that kind of thing. So basically we could focus on uh, research areas. And then, you know, when I, when I wrote something, he will edit it, you know, called slash, 
And then when he did the same thing, when he wrote something, I would edit or add stuff, you know. So for example, when he wrote parts that involved Britain, I was able to, I mean, I know a bit, a bit of yeah. British history, so I was able to add some other stuff. So, so yeah, so I'll probably say top everything together, two years, you know, wow. but then again, that helped because it was two of us, you know, so it was two people. If yeah. it was one person, I don't know, it would have taken easily four, four years, just be, just to be able to get through the material. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> I actually, you know, reading it, I actually thought that it was the other way around. That for some reason, that Fola did the North. I don't know why oh, I felt that way. And that uh, you did the South, and then you handled, you know, some of the British aspect of it. But yeah, that's 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 interesting. Um, Stanley, out there, hand it over to you from this point. Yeah. So um, I have I got the book too. Thank you. Thank um, you guys for buying. Appreciate. It. Yeah. I got I I ordered I pre-ordered so I got it okay. early before before it came out. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I haven't finished reading. Um, about midway. So I will stick. I will leave my questions to the part okay. um, where ready. I have read. So my question is with respect to your choice of uh title for the chapters. They were like sort of like a play on on. <laughs> they were yeah. sort of hilarious. Yeah. I don't know if any other person noticed that as well. It, yeah. Both the chapter titles and, and the subtitles was like a play on some somebody on a bit of dramatic, if I may say. Why why did you go through that approach? Is it like intentional to grab our attention? You know? Mm. Or... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, definitely. But you know, like I mentioned earlier, we, we are trying to refresh the story for a younger mm. generation. So mm. that, is def that was definitely our target, you know, the younger generation, maybe 40 and below, that sort of thing. And so you try and use stuff that people can, you know, relate to. There's a bit of Game of Thrones going on there. Yeah. There's a bit of Beyonce that, going that, on. That completely caught my attention. So yeah. I was like, okay, there's something yeah. going on here. With, uh, yeah, yeah. With yeah. I, you know, some of them, like, you know, some of these were, I, I don't know why, for some weird reason, I like, you know, in fact, I was just writing a blog post today, which I'll post maybe later today. I like using films as my titles for some weird reason. So, you know, you might see a river runs through it. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> that was very title, nice. You know, that, that's, you know, so, so I think that was, um yeah, we, we just wanted to, you know, how would you call it? Pop culture references, if you like, you know, again, to, to the target being the younger generation of Nigerians who, who are coming to the story for the first time. It, it, it worked really because um, every other title I wanted to see, sort of understand the reasoning behind uh, the choice. So it, it really worked. I want to just be specific with my questions to two areas. Okay. One is something uh, you guys had written in page 50. I put bookmarks because you know, I wanted to sort of find some interesting um, things we can deal with. It's about big government, page 50, if you, if you look at the book, it's, it's where you guys talked about big government, you know. So I have like, a yeah. bit of work with government and every day I'm, I just do not understand um, why we're like this. Um, is this who we are? Should I stop fighting? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe you should, yeah, I think, I think it's, um, yeah, I think you are, unfortunately, I think you are right. Uh, maybe, so it doesn't mean you should stop fighting, maybe you should fight in a different way. <laughs> you know, so, so maybe the fight is not that oh government is too big maybe you know we, we have to fight in a way to you know mm -hmm. i don't know maybe cap the size or try and uh control how much we spend on it so whatever the size of it you know so i mean you, there, there are mechanisms in other countries whereby you know it is spending that is capped so if you like higher one million people if you like higher one thousand it is the amount of spend i think i think for us i don't know i don't know how we can do it but that would be a, a challenge in the sense that you know how much of our budgets or our earnings as a country should we really be spending on running the government it's a philosophical question you know we can say you know 50 percent and no more you know, 70% are no more, but, you know, we've reached, we, I mean, we've had recently in, in, in a few years, a few years ago, where even all, all the oil revenues could not pay salaries, oh, yeah. you know, we should not, we should find a way to allow, to, to not allow ourselves to be in that kind of situation, because, you know, if you cannot invest in the future, in, in you, what are you doing? You know, you are paying salaries for people today, you know, you cannot put aside anything to say, okay, you know, what, let's just throw this one billion you know, into the future and then let's see what will happen in 2050 
when we get there? What would it become? You know, so we, so I think, I think, you know, it's unfortunate, you know, like you said, you know, I mean, um, Dan Fodio had a, a clear idea that the government should be small, you know, mm -hmm. he, he, you know, it was just, he only named a few offices, you know, by the time Belo took over and Belo actually began the work of actually running a proper government, you know, as a, as an executive. So you had Dan Fodio was pretty much kind of like a ceremonial spiritual leader. Yeah, you know, yeah. Bello was actually a, an executive, you know. So you can argue that yeah, he probably needed more offices. Fair enough. But then, you know, what was the limit? You know, I mean, which, how far should it have gone? You know, I think. But, I mean, but it's also interesting that in expanding the government, he went out of his way to also find a means of funding the expansion. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's keeping things like um tax and, and all of those things he did to be able to fund uh the government. It wasn't just that you know he was expanding without sort of the yeah, he tried to put you know, he tried to put things on a sound fiscal footing, and you know, you can probably say that um for those guys basically studied the Abbasid Caliphate, which was in in you know, in today's Iraq, you know, the thousands of years ago, you know, they, they had a structure to build on. And, you know, Abdullahi, which was uh, Dan Fodio's brother, he, he was the constitutionalist who actually took the vision that Dan Fodio had and then he wrote it down into a constitution. So, so they had a, a structure that they wanted to work with. And, you know, they were, they were not corrupt. You know, these guys, I mean, at least that first set, they were not corrupt in whatever definition you might use. The, the first set, you know, once we got, once we started coming down after below, it was um, anything you see, take it. <laughs> take, it. <laughs> take it like that. <laughs> but, but eventually there was a decline, you know. There oh, was... no, 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 def definitely. After it, it was the first 11. After that first 11, anything from the substitute, then it, it didn't. You can, it, it's painful to watch. You can see the decline. Yeah. You know, right after Benue, everything just, just started getting quality, you know. And, and part of the problem, I think one of the things we talked about in the book was that part of the problem is that it's a built-in problem when you have a hereditary system. Mm. You know, you are limited in the in the amount of talent you can bring from us. So all the offices were hereditary, even chief of army staff yeah. was hereditary. You know, I mean, or so so I want at some point, you know. You have a hereditary system. You have a you have a, a system that obviously favors the male child. At some point, you're going to get a child who is not interested, you know, mm -hmm. or who will not be able to put in the work, who will not live up to your expectation. It's mm -hmm. it's just normal. It happens all the time. Look at the like the Tata uh, yeah. group, for example. They have brought mm -hmm. in outsiders to run to run the company. See, it's not that they don't have Tata children, but you know, at the point where Tata has become a multi-billion-dollar conglomerate with operations everywhere around the world, it becomes very risky to start saying, we are going to stick to, you know, Family. first born son uh, only, you know, it, it, it's very dangerous. But, you know, the, the caliphate yeah. was was that way. By the time you started getting to, you know, different people, I mean, like you, you the chief of army staff, for example, it took a while for them to break the hold of, you know, hereditary system, yeah. because it got to a point where, I mean, the, the descendants of the original uh, chief of army staff, they, they didn't want to fight. They, they were not interested in fights. They, they would <laughs> get to a battlefront and they would just run away. Yeah. You know, or they would find a way to dodge, you know. So after after a while, you know, so I, I think I think that system is just, you know, that's just how we, you are not hiring talent. You know, when you run out of talent, you'll be forced to, you know, just, you know. One, one more question, Danny, before I... No, 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 so, carry on, please. So, so um... Uh, so I was wondering, you know, it's good that you talked about this whole succession um, thing. And, and like you said from the beginning, this is sort of like a refresh. Uh, give us an idea of what the past was as, as it guides us to the future. So, and I had said something recently, and one of my friends spent hours on the phone with me arguing about it. And, and it's about um, the whole zoning for the presidential election. This is my last question, sorry. I just want to be- No, please, please. Um, and seeing how uh, that limited choice in terms of succession in the past, limited our ability to get talent had said something about how, I think that zoning put, keeps away, uh, you know, the most useful people and, you know, leaves the, the less desirable people to run. You know, they are the ones with, once you put zoning in the picture, they're the ones with, 
the most ability to, to win elections. Do you, and I, I'm of the opinion that we should get rid of it, right? Uh, and I think that the field should be left open, whoever can convince the most Nigerians. It might look foolish in the early days, in my opinion, but I think that with time, um, you know, competence will take, take over because this is not working. What do you think about zoning? You know, keeping in mind, you know, what you said about the whole succession um, of that era. Yeah, your point is, 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 is a very good one. And, you know, and I, I think there's actually another problem with zoning. You know, so anybody who has read Gladwell, for example, you know, you see this whole thing about uh, birth cohorts, right? So a country might have a period whereby people just had more children or maybe there was something good that happened in the country at a given point. Like, you know, like, I mean, for America, for example, uh, there was only one year, I think, is it, what is the year now? Is it 1930, no, sorry, 1943, I think is the year that has produced three presidents. You know, so Clinton, Trump, and um, who's the third person? I can't remember now, you know, but, but, but anyway, one particular year has produced Three presidents. Would that be Bush? Yeah. Bush. Bush. Yeah. Yeah. Bush. Yeah. Yeah. Bush. Yeah. You know. So the, you know. But these are these were the baby boom years, right? So you had a whole cohort of people who those those guys were culturally dominant in everything in America. They they blew up, you know. And obviously, the way births move is that there has been pretty much no period like that again. So, just imagine that you have more children, it means that you probably have more talent. Now, what zoning does is that <clears throat> you are going to lose out on a lot of people because just, just because no matter how talented you are, the thing might root it away from your side and you will never have a shot. You know, so, so I think this is one of the, the challenges. This whole, uh, you know, there will be, when it goes to the South, you know, when it goes to the South, no matter how talented you are as a northerner of a particular generation, it will pass you. Absolutely. You know, yeah. when it goes to the north, it will happen again. And you can see it now, this is what is causing the desperation of someone like Tenumbu. You know, for example, he knows that it, this thing is, I mean, in I, it, it, however you think about it, there really is no reason why you should have another Yoruba president now in 2023. You know, if we are being fair and honest you know you guys have had a president for the past eight years we've had another vice president now with Oshimba who will probably do another uh another eight years you know i mean Igbos have not had a president you know good luck jonathan the south south they are truncated people from the middle belt have a you know will have a you know they have a, 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 a claim yeah. to it so well, yeah. really <laughs> but you don't see you know, but you see the kind of desperation of somebody like Tinubu, right? I mean, it's all over the place. You know, they are spending money. They are said, because once this thing rotates away, <clears throat> if it rotates away from the southwest, it's not even rotating to the southwest, but it's claiming that it's coming there. Yeah. If this cycle goes, that's it. Tinubu is what is he seventy or something, or there about, or maybe even probably older. You know, if it goes away for eight years, it's not going to come back for him. In a, you know, so so I, I guess you are seeing the way that that kind of desperation is showing up in this, in the sense that you know, once something rotates away from your zone, it wipes out a generation, regardless of how talented or good you are, and then it goes around and it comes back. So you know, I agree with you that you know we should have a system whereby, at any given point in time, let everyone have a have a shot. Maybe we're not yet mature enough for it. You know, I mean, we had a lot of challenges just with dealing with the minority president with, uh, and good, good luck, Jonathan. But, you know, uh, the, the solution is not to say, ah, no, 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 we're not ready. Let's not do it again. We yeah, will do it again. Let's never do it. Do, you know, so, you know, so I think, I think, you know, I definitely agree with you that we should, you know, it, I mean, what has Zoni done for anybody? What has it delivered? I mean, what's the worst that can happen if we zone it away from if we if we abandon zoning and then we just somehow allow the person who can build? You know, so so yeah, I agree definitely on that. Thank you, uh, Yep. Um. So, uh, Wale, thank you for joining us. Um, what we're doing right now is that we're going around the room and anyone with questions, uh, ask. Um, I, I've I've still got a few questions myself, but um, I don't want to be greedy. Um. <laughs> Mondu. No, um, no, no, sorry, sorry. Mondu, Mondu hasn't. Mondu's time. Okay. I'll just let I'll just let you know what's going on. Okay. No, Mondu. no. I was I was gonna say sorry for for 
jumping into the conversation um halfway. Daddy duties. That's why I couldn't come in on. Before you guys. You know, you know, you know, you know. We can't say anything when you say. Once you say that, you know, there's, not, there's nothing we can do. It's my, co- it's my cop uh, out. It's, 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 better, it's, it's better than traffic. <laughs> okay, Mondi, you please. Okay, so, um, I haven't bought the book, and I have to pre-order it from Canada. Uh, I don't know why, but oh, you oh, guys in have Canada. It. Okay. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it comes out in May. Unfortunately, May, that's yeah. the earliest we could get to North America. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, that's yeah, what Mondi what... left us. He brexited before Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was actually after. No, it was after the vote, but it was before Brexit was implemented. Okay. So. okay um, so my question is, when you oh, of course you've done a lot of work in terms of research on Nigeria's history uh, before the British came in. So, and of course, you would have seen a lot of correlation between, you know, this thing about history telling us a lot about the present. Mm -hmm. So now, when you look at the challenges we we are facing with insecurity and the stuff we are hearing from uh, what's happening in the North and how that pressure is coming down South and um, I don't really like what's going on now with uh, this, the uh, Fulani Hertzman issues, and it's, di- it's diving into proper tribalism where you have tribal warlords springing up. Now, when you looked at the history and did your research, did you see this coming? Unfortunately, oh, yes. Because, well, not that we saw it coming, but we've seen it before, you know, so it's all there. You know all this stuff. I mean, one of the things we try to highlight in the book is that, you know, one of the triggers for the for the dump, uh, for the jihad was actually headsmen and farmers fight. This is 1804, 1805. That's what 200 solid years ago. You know, whereby uh, um, Danford Johan, he 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 was kind of like a teacher, so he ran a school and he had a lot of disciples who had spread across um, the north of the country and. When the jihad kicked off in Gobri in Sokoto, you know, and then people saw that they had kind of won, you know, a lot of the way we describe it in the book is a lot of freelance jihadis, you know, took up arms. And in some particular places, the people who, you know, they were like almost like you know, Danfordio students, and they now they now rose up against their hosts, you know, and took over the place. In some of the places, the reason. The, the trigger was these clashes between headsmen and farmers. You know, we have never been able to do a basic thing about headsmen. And this is that having a, a livestock industry that just has the basic tenets of sustainability. You know, a friend of mine was, who is in Nigeria was telling me, works in government, was telling me recently that, you know, I mean, he broke down the numbers for me. Unfortunately, I, I can't, I don't have the ball. Basically, you know, it, a group of like what, 20 cows, a head of 20 cows will probably drink like 20 gallons of water a day. You know, that's just water, you know, and then they feed as well. Now, once you price in those costs, what we are doing in Nigeria makes zero sense. You know, so fundamentally, this is the starting point of the problem whereby people cannot run this thing as just, just a basic debit and credit business. You know, where the, the business is basically, the, what you spend should be lower than what you earn. That's all. Once farmers have to pay for the food and the water that they are, you know, it is just completely a mess. So they go about eating free food, you know, and you've seen videos on the internet where, you know, having clashes with that, that, that's That is just the basic starting point of this whole mess, whereby people don't want to be able to run it as a normal, regular business. And the government does not seem to, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it was in 2019, I was sharing a book that I read, you know, I posted one of the books I read, Diane, you know, it's called a Red Meat Republic. And the fight between headers and farmers in America was distinct. It was exactly like what you see now, you know, head where farmer, uh, cowboys with their cows will go and eat somebody's food and then things will turn to fight and all that until the government eventually stepped in. You know, and then you know, ranching came through. It went through it, you know, different iterations of of um, policy making until it finally got to the point where okay, you could settle down the the livestock farmers. Even you know, I mean, even in Burkina Faso, 
you know, I've been reading about Sankara as well. One of his policies was, you know, basically stop cows from roaming, you know, and then try to get people to, uh, uh, to, to farm more sustainably. But we've never done any of this. You know, we're still fighting the same exact same battles. You know, headers now, the thing is that they overgraze. So they will use one land, they will completely graze it and they move elsewhere. So they can't return to that place for an, until another year which means that they then have to keep going further and further and further, you know, because they've completely destroyed the land, the, the, the grazing, and then you have to go away for one year before you can come back to that place, so, which obviously brings you down further and further south. And then you're getting to the south, which is more densely populated, and then your cows are just running into people's farms, eating, <clears throat> eating their hardened, you know, work. So now we're not at the point whereby we have a president who, it was, maybe doesn't even know what's going on. You know, he's just, he's just a, there's definitely no solution coming from it. And there's a lot of suspicion. So the work is cut out for anybody who wants to do it now. If, any, if people say they want to do Ruga, you know, whether or not the Ruga is dodgy or not, but people are, you know, the suspicion is heightened. So it, it is a big challenge. Unfortunately, now it's coming to a real head. Back then, you know, it happened all the time back then, but, you know, it was smaller population, um, across the country, you know, we people clashed, and and but and it was kind of like lawless, you know, in the sense that I mean, it was fact, organized. Yeah, exactly. You kill yourselves and all that. In fact, one of the, the interesting stories was that <clears throat> insecurity, you right, is a story of Nigeria for how many years? But insecurity was one of the ways in which Lugard managed to change the country's currency. It is a fascinating story. So, you know, the Portuguese showed up in the 15th century and they brought cowries with them. Now, those cowries stayed with us for 300 plus years, you know, exchange for slaves. It was the currency of Nigeria for three centuries plus. And even when it got so bad that there was so much cowrie inflation, whereby people had to carry bags and bags of cowrie, cowries around with them. People still used it. Now, Lugard shows up. And he has military, uh, obviously he has guns and all that kind of thing. And then what he's done, what he did was he created a, a um, new routes, trading routes, right? So almost like kind of like infrastructure. Basically, you clear a road through the country, through the north, where people, traders could pass through. And it provided security there on those roads, right? So, so you, and then he charged a toll for it. So you enter at the beginning and then you pay a certain amount, and then at each further toll, you pay an amount cap that I think it was 15%. So once you had hit 15% of the value of the goods you were doing, because you could branch off you know, at different points in the road. So if you only use one part of it, then you branch off, you only pay for that part. But once you hit a certain point, then you, you keep going and you don't have to pay any additional toll. But he then said that he will only accept payments for the for for the toll in silver coin, which was what they brought when the British had been bringing into the country, you know, and this just completely transformed, you know. I mean, normally you might say, ah, this new guy comes, so because he built a road, you want to collect new currency, people will just abandon and maybe just leave you know, but the insecurity was so bad that people decided that you know actually we'll convert to this guy's currency, and that was how the carry was removed from Nigeria three centuries plus, and it was literally in the matter of months, you know, it was gone. So people would suffer in silence for a long time, you know, but, but insecurity was so bad that people basically just bought into Lugard's money, you know, and they paid their taxes and they paid their tolls using that. And that was not, so it's a story, you know, of Nigeria because if you didn't pass the road that Lugard guarded, where even if you pass anywhere, I mean, slavers, there were bandits, there were all kinds of people catching slaves, even though slavery had been all kinds of people catching slaves. They, they catch, you know, anything could happen to you. But at least you knew that if you passed through God's route, there was security protection, you know, so people dumped. They I mean, before this time, you know, some kings would be traveling and because the calories were too much to carry, they would just take slaves, you know, and they use the slaves as, as payments. So it was actually kind of like lighter for you to carry a whole person, you know, rather than just carrying bags and bags and bags of carry, you know. So, so I think this is an example of how insecurity has been with us for a very long time. 
and it, it's no news. Unfortunate that you have to then start seeing, they say, at least some people solve problems, you know, and they are faced with new problems. It's kind of depressing when, you know, Nigeria is fighting a 200 year old battle as if nothing has happened in 200 years, you know, and, and here we are again. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm generally optimistic about the future, but I'm, I'm really pessimistic about a lot of what is going on right now. It's, um, it, it's, it's dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. And the leadership is not up to it. I mean, when, when Obasanjo was head of state, sorry, when I was president here, you know, I, me- I can never forget a time when a friend of mine here, he was moving to Nigeria and he went to hire a container to carry his goods. And as soon as he got there, he told the guy that he wanted to hire a container, an Indian guy. The guy was like, what is going on in Nigeria? That you are like the 10th person this week. Every day somebody is coming here to, you know, other container, they want to move their things to Nigeria. What exactly is going on? Why is everybody, you know, and it was, there was insecurity under Abbasanjo, electricity, there was no electricity, you know, there was, but there was something of hope that people felt that something was happening and you could be part of it. You know, this is the cheapest thing that a leader can, can do. It doesn't cost any money, but to infuse the people hope and say, look, where we are today is not where we're going to be tomorrow. You know, and then get people to come along with you on that journey. But very good. Doesn't even talk. Doesn't even talk to people. So you know, people. Yeah, when he even talks, you know, the kind of vision he gives, like farming. You know, I just think to myself that, you know, I mean, is this really it? Regressive and depressing. E- exactly, and he's, you know, he doesn't fill anyone with, with any kind of hope that you can say, okay, you know, what, let me come along for the ride. You know, and I, I think for me, that's the biggest challenge because when you have all these problems and leadership cannot provide that basic hope you just have to wonder people are checking out of the future of nigeria they are checking out i mean this new superhero that appeared out of nowhere in the southwest sunday go the kind of stuff that these people are, are saying openly it sounds like it sounds funny i mean it's always like laughter today i saw something a website saying you're back consulates you know, they're, they're launching their, their Yoruba concert here. Yeah. The guy on the other day on, on the internet, I saw him holding what he called the uh, Fadaka, the new Yoruba currency. Yeah. You know, telling people to leave. Look, some of these things are funny, but, you know, there was a video my mom showed me some weeks ago that, you know, someone forwarded to her from Nigeria. There was a fire. Uh, they, they, well, they said some people were talking somewhere in Oyo State, and they were saying, oh, the, yeah, that the Fulani have come, they've burnt down our whole village. Now, we didn't, they didn't show any burnt houses or anything, but they, they were just talking about, oh, the Fulani have come and burnt down this thing. And at the end of the video, the people who were shouting and crying, I say, next thing, you're such a, please call Sunday Bo for us, so let him come and save us. And I'm thinking that, I mean, this guy in five minutes, he just appeared on the scene and he's become a superhero that people are now calling to come and rescue. And this is the kind of, you know, atmosphere we have is it ripe for ethnic entrepreneurs, you know, just enter the fray, say those guys are the bad guys and people will rally around. And people are checking out on the future of the country, which is the really dangerous part, you know. But so, so, and I want to go back to the question uh, uh, Mondu asked about the headsmen and how this has, and you, like you acknowledge, it's not new. Um, and I'm curious, you know, there was this long debate about uh, the middle, uh, somebody posted the a map of Nigeria that the issue. <laughs> that they raised, they raised us. We <laughs> raised. <laughs> the, the, middle, the middle belt. Um, and I'm just curious because seeing that this, this is, well, maybe because this is happening during our time, it seems like this whole um, headers, farmers disagreement has really hit the South uh, forcefully. And I'm just imagining this forceful um, attempt to take over farms to feed cows, uh, pass through the middle belt. How bad was it for, for, for people in, in that region that we are getting to see this in the South now? So it's different, and, and it was different back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it was different back then because back then the Nupes were, they were not anybody's, you know, small meat. They were, they, they, they were a warrior kingdom, you know. And I mean, to survive in the middle of Nigeria in those days, 
where the North are raiding you for slaves, the South are raiding you for slaves, everybody around you. But to survive and hold your own, you know, they were a warrior, you know, kingdom. And, you know, they dealt with people around them as well, you know, as, as well, to the point whereby you had a kind of equilibrium whereby the Nupes became a trading post for so many different things, right? So, you know, for example, all the elephants that were killed in Adamawa back then in the 19th century, and then the Tusk, you know, they were trans, it, it, Nupe was the trading, it was the clearing house for uh, ivory. You know, all the foreigners who came to buy ivory in Nigeria, it was from Nupe. They had a lot of things that they made as well. So, so back then that was the difference. You know, today it's kind of different, you know, things have happened. The, the Nupe you're referring to now covers basically Niger State. Niger State, mm -hmm. a little bit of, even a bit of Kogi State as well. There's Nupe. In yeah, there's, I think there's a bit yeah. of Kogi. There's a bit, there's know. a bit in Kogi State as well. Mm -hmm. And then so yeah, people so. like um, the Thief, the Jukun, mm -hmm. and all of those those people either suffered violence from from down south or from not no, yeah. basically. And, the and, and they developed a martial, a lot of them developed a martial nature, like just self-defense, you know, I don't know. I mean, there was a point in time when they used to say that a lot of the army infantry were from yeah, the yeah. middle belt part of the country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I think today they are capable of defending themselves. We don't, I don't want to find out, you know, it, it's not, it's not something that anybody should be wanting to find out about Nigeria today. You don't want the middle belt to start carrying arms and then say, oh, we're going to defend ourselves and then we'll fight. You know, I mean, you saw, was it two years ago, T.Y. Dan Juma saying he was going, telling people to carry guns and all that. Kind of thing, yeah. you, know? you know, and that's another part of Nigeria that is very, very martial. You know, they carry guns and they fight, they would, you know, identities. People will take it as they fight to the finish that you want to wipe us out. That, that's what, I mean, and, and when people are in that mode, that, oh, you want to wipe us out, we'll carry, and it is fight to finish. It is fight, it, it is fight to finish. So this is not a fight where somebody will surrender and say, okay, you know what, you win, no, no, no. You know, it is fight to the last man. Ooh, know, so, sorry, sorry guys, I'm not trying to do, dominate. No, 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 carry on, carry on. Um, but I'm just- Wale, I just you're to next, move, by the way. I just wanted to move a bit um, uh, south and I know um, a bit of work was done around the whole of Egba and all the rest of, that region, Abiyokuta and, and those places. But I'm just curious about the relationship between um, the Benin Kingdom and, and those other people that were around them, you know. They seem to have been a formidable kingdom. Who were they battling with back then? You know, because it seemed like they were strong. You know, when, if I think about how much resistance they put into the colonial, put into resisting the colonial masters, who were their major adversaries? So it's an interesting one because, um, I mean, uh, our story starts in 1804. So at that point, the Benin Kingdom had picked, you know, oh. same like we Oyo. And, you know, at the point we start, you see, the Oyo Kingdom had disintegrated already at that point, which is what gave us places like Egba. You know, the, the Benin Kingdom picked, it really picked in the 18th century, you know, and you had going to the point whereby people like the Sheki were able to now fight with them and hold, you know, and hold their own against them, you know. So, so I think the Benin Kingdom, the fight was a lot of these fights were slave fights, you know, basically raiding people for slaves, you know. A, a lot of middle belt and minorities in the north suffered this problem as well. Anyone who was a minority, you know, in the vicinity in the vicinity of a, a big kingdom, you know, you suffered. You know, the Nupes, you know, they, I mean, the middle belt of Nigeria, which is the point I was trying to make to, to that tweet, is that it is a hugely diverse place, you know. And Nupe, you might talk about Nupe as a big kingdom, but there were so many other different people around them. And you will find places where it might be 100 or 200 people, but they, we, are not, we want to be independent. You know, there's a streak of independence that runs through so many different groups in Nigeria. It's, it's amazing. Like, you know, a small group of people, 10,000, 5,000, 2,000, we don't want to be under anybody. And the British were able to use this very, very uh, cleverly. So when they were going to bring down Nupe, for example, they just went around promising people independence. That once, if you just help or support us, you know, we'll grant you independence. I mean, the independence was 
quote unquote, it was it was, a, it was in brackets that kind of independence. But you know, just the fact that some people say they don't want to be under these people who have been terrorizing us before, you know, then you know, and and so so Benin, you know, anyone who was around those areas, all those small small tribes, the middle belt, you know, they, people will come and raid you, you know, and Benin were the ones who controlled the slave trade for a very long time. So so I think that was what. Uh, that's what you might uh, you, uh, you might say. I mean, we didn't cover that much. We we covered Benin in the context of the Benin expedition in eighteen ninety seven. But uh, yeah, over to you. Okay, um, Wale, I'm on leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no, 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 no. So today I'm going to I'm just going to play calm because this is this is someone that I actually. Uh, I respect a lot. I was telling my wife that I don't think I'm going to be able to join uh, today's session because uh, our son got immunization jabs, uh, so he's just been really cranky. Twelve months uh, immunization, so, and it's just two of us. And this this whole weekend has just been, you know, but you know, a bit too much. It's been fifty four weeks now of in, in in this room of you know just working. And this, I've, I, I don't know what my colleagues look like anymore. I don't know if all the new people that I've, I've been working with in the last one year, if they have a third leg or if they have one eye at the back of their head. I don't know, because this is all I get to do, you know? Uh, it's been a year and two weeks now. So, but I, I think I messaged Stanley. I was like, Stanley, who are we having tonight? And it was like, for you, I was like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll join you five. So, um, again, someone I respect so much. So thanks for coming. I, I need to show my own copy of the book as well. Uh, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Every, <laughs> everyone was showing theirs, uh, I thought, uh, except for Mondu, I think. Uh, yeah, because I live in Russia. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the one, so, Ale, one, of the, one of the first questions that I wanted to ask um, for you was, so this, this book came out at a time when there's a lot of, um, a lot of conversations happening around the, the history of Nigeria. Also, you know, um, connecting with the part around the slavery and things like that. And specifically, there was uh, another person who did um, a fantastic groundwork, and that's Shukwo, uh, Ola Shukwo Shashore, uh, mm. Journey of an African Colony. And, you know, I just wanted to ask you, was there any kind of collaboration between you two? Did you, did your paths cross? I know you did most of his research from the um, um, libraries in, in London, British um, Library and things like that. But, you know, did you, did you guys do any kind of work together? Because I've seen that piece of work. I'm just like, you know, a quarter into this book because of, you know, a lot of other things taking my time. But I'm seeing a lot of, you know, um, similarities, of course, because the, the, the facts are the same, you know. But just wanted to be sure, did you guys do any kind of collaborations, you know? No, no. So, you know, it's, um, it's, it's interesting, you know, that whole thing about you waiting for a boss, for how long and then all of a sudden to in fact the, yeah yeah the more interesting one is maxiolum's book because he covered although he covered the bit more but it is, the book is very our books are very very similar and, you know we, we, we had no planning or whatever sometimes it's just a groundswell you know that people just say oh you know what let's let's talk about this for example so we and there's also the yeah go on go on for you know, so sometimes, sometimes something just topical you know, yeah, people just yeah. want to know a bit more. So, so it, from the point of, from our point of view, it's a wonderful thing. You know, the, the more there cannot be too much history in a country like Nigeria. I mean, I always tell people that the U.S. Civil War, which ended in 1865, I saw it start uh, a few years ago. That since the end of the Civil War, that you can have a different book on the Civil War in America every day till today. You know, so, so that is the, that movies, is movies <laughs> that is the, so that is the number of books that have actually book, been, yeah. been written. Every people have covered every angle, small, big, large, that sort of thing. We we don't even we have not even scratched the surface. I mean, I was saying yeah. it recently, you know, I was asking for which is why I enjoyed the Sankara book so much because it's very rare for an African leader. You find a book where it goes into his childhood, you know, what shaped his views, that sort of it's yeah. common here. You know, I mean, here I was reading a book about Churchill a couple of years ago. I mean, the first time he ever dialed the telephone, it's in there. You know, those kinds. Of, so the details are all, you know, covered. You get like, and there have been one thousand books on Churchill. You know, we in Nigeria, there's no biography of Buhari that can tell you, you know, what his childhood was like. You just have <laughs> ideas of, you know, you know, you know Obasanjo 
he writes it up, but that's because he wants to form a version of the story by shape, himself. He wants to shape his own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, a lot of times he wants to hide the truth. You know, so he's basically putting out his stories, they're pumping it out. It's just so that before anybody else can say anything about him, you know, he has given you the version that he wants you to know whether or not it is true. You know, but beyond that, you know, we don't, there's just no, you know, we don't, we don't dive in deep into our, and, and then we miss out a little bit. We, we end up being surprised by somebody uh, in, in power. You know, so. Don't throw jabs, don't throw jabs, don't throw jabs. <laughs> <laughs> So, but, but we can extrapolate that, right? We can extrapolate that problem of that documentation about individuals also to the scale of the entity that is the people of the country. Um, and so when we see books like this, and there are so many books about Nigeria, of course, but when we see books like this, which goes into that level of details, it's refreshing. But what does that, what does that mean for us as a country where, you know, like you said, there is no detailed documentation about people's past, the biographies. And so that translates, you know, if you look at it, if you double click out, it's, it's, it's a problem of documentation that we have, we've had as a people. And then, so, you know, we don't, we don't have that history. And I expect that I should be able to pick a book on, you know, on Egba today, or I should be able to pick like 20 or 30 books, you know, talking about, and then if you, if you look at it, so, or not, your book is great, but this is packing a lot of history. Mm, a lot of different things, yeah. Going you know, on, yeah. and I can expect that this can be 40 different books in, in this in this kind of stuff with the same level of detail, with the same level of, you know, um, groundwork. So what does that mean? Because, you know, like I said, I followed some of your work. You know, I've, I joined the Chatham House uh, call. I've, I've listened to some of the podcasts you've done, the one with um, um, Tommy Oladipo, um, a couple other ones, and I think the theme that you're you, you're you're putting forward is that look, we're doing this because we want people to accept the past, like just acknowledge that this happened, mm-hmm. just 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 come to terms with it. We, we're not we're not trying to tell you that you know somebody was wrong or this person was wrong. Or we're just saying, just be aware that this all this happened. Now, what does that mean for us going forward? Because if we draw parallels, you know, some of the things that Stanley has talked about, the, the Herdsman War, you've linked that, and I've seen I've seen some of those uh, books as well. All those things, we are at a point where, okay, let me ask you this. Do you think we're at a point where that past, it's now time for us to make decisions about it going to the future, or, or we're still on the journey of, of reaching maturity? I don't know if you know, I'm, if you get what I'm saying, I'm saying yeah. there's a tipping point. Are we there? Are we still on that journey to that point? Or are we long past, or as a ship still, that we missed a huge opportunity as a country? Right. So that's a, I'll take that as two questions. So the first part is um, one of the things I used to be, I, I, tell, I tell people that I used to be, I, I'm very, very, I used to be very, very dismissive and snobbish about oral history. You know, it's not reliable. You know, it has problems. But now the, the challenge is this, like you, you can think of any story in the Bible, say any of the stories about Moses, for example, say the Ten Commandments, you know, those stories were initially told uh, orally, right? And then the thing with oral history is that <clears throat> as it, the more it gets told, people will strip out any, mm-hmm. anything that is superfluous to the story. So anything that is not the core of the story, it gets stripped out. So for example, a boy, a, a great guy was born in the middle of Nigeria in 1500 or something. Maybe at the beginning of that story, it will tell you, and it's told already, maybe it will tell you that, oh, there were lions in the area where he was born, that sort of thing, what the environment was like, there were different you know, things that are no longer there today, right? So if that story is maintained intact, you then begin to get an idea that, hmm, okay, so this is what the environment was like, not just the story of the person. But as it's told, those lions will disappear. And what will be left in the oral version of the story is just the story of the boy. But, yeah. He did this and that, and, you know, and that's so. all. So again, you look at the, the Bible story, at the point where the story stopped changing was when it was written down. You know, so when the Bible came and then the story stopped moving around and then you had a, a version of it, you know. It, 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 so, so this is one of the challenges we have in the, 
you know, oral history. And there was something that came that I saw one time where, you know, somebody sent me a video. Um, some some tourists they went to Badagri to that first you know the duplex so in Nigeria, building, yeah, yeah. So rebuilding Nigeria, and, and you know the guy who was the tour guide there, this guy was amazing. You know he was switching between Yoruba and English, and then the people were around him, and he was basically calling dates and names offhand. You know all the missionaries they came in eighteen so so so. You know this is the story of that. Uh, you know and he just basically he was giving and as you're saying it. <clears throat> Everybody was like, ah, there was, there was feedback. You know, the people were like, wow, mm-hmm. is that so? You know, uh, you know, Nigerians. I feel uh, like this is going to end in a bad way. <laughs> no, no. So you know, so I just thought to myself that, okay, there's something going on here, right? Mm. This is, you know, there is something maybe culturally about us that relates better to oral than any other type of thing, you know. And but 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 you know, it was history. The guy was telling the history, and people were engaging with it. You know, so it came to me, and I thought to myself that you know what the problem with our oral history is retrievability. Once we can solve that problem, then it is not inferior; it's no longer inferior anymore. If we can commit our oral history to a way whereby it can be retrieved, and technology now allows us. And something I've been telling people, you know, ever since uh, this book is that if your parents are alive, record a podcast with them. Just ask them everything. Just record. You don't have to publish it. You don't have to put it out there. Just record it. You know, talk to them. I've been doing that them. with my mom. I've been yeah, doing I that did with my mom. I, yeah, my mom was 80 last year. I did one with her. So I it was talking to her. I just discovered so many things. Like, I mean, this is my mother. I didn't, you know, but at least it's there now, you know. It, it, so just basically record it. And once we do that, then our oral history becomes retrievable. And then we solve that problem of whereby the history keeps getting squashed and crunched and then so much of it is lost you know so that, so i think this was a this has been one of the, <clears throat> the challenges of of nigeria whereby you i mean when you look at nigeria when we're doing the research for formation right like 1800s within 40 30 that whole period of time there's very very i mean somebody like down for you there's one bio on him one good bio on him and that, <laughs> and that bio is what like 200 pages or something this is such you a know? Such an important man yeah, in our yeah, history just, that we yeah, should. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's just have those years, yeah. Him, you know, and, and we're even lucky because those guys, because they were Fulani, uh, kind of like Fulani elites who had a lot of education, at least they could write, you know, so at least they documented their own version of history. And in fairness to them, you know, they were, they, they, they tried to be honest, you know, even when they made mistakes, Baylor wrote it down. You know, which is kind of surprising, which is why we have that kind of uh, thing. So, but then by the time we get to the late 19th century, then there's so much material when the British came. You know, I mean, somebody like Lugard, he filled his diary every day. And Lugard was a PR master, you know, because everything he was doing, he wanted to make sure that he was controlling the narrative in London. So, yeah. you know, he wrote a lot, you know, he wrote books, you know, and then, and then he was like Marmite as well. So some people, it's people like, who like him. Yeah, I like him. You know, you know, they were they were intensely loyal to him. He, they were fiercely loyal to him. So, and the people who hated him absolutely hated him. all those people. Wrote books. People who like Lugard, you know, yeah. who wanted to secure his legacy for him. They wrote their own. People who hated him, they wrote their own. You know, and then obviously he himself, he now wrote his own, trying to he did tons. He did tons of work in his western yeah, exactly. So, so by then you yeah. take all of those together, you have a generally. A uh, good story, you know. Again, his wife was also an editor. She, she wrote a lot as well. So you have a lot of material. So I think you know, our history may not. We might never get to a point where you know the dominant form of our history is a written down version. But you know, as of today, we have the technology to be able to allow us at least retrieve our oral history. Mm. You know, um, Faye, I just wanted to f- follow up on that. Sorry, sorry, Stanley. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up on that because it was one of the questions I was going to ask. I don't want, since you're already talking about it, we might as well. So from your own studies so far, based on the research you've done for this book, from what I've read, from what I've read in your book, it appears to me that a history before we started interacting with either the Arabs to the north or with the Portuguese to the south or with the Europeans in general, it's just... It's like it's just darkness, and then um, history starts from when we started to interact with the outside world. Am I right in saying that that most of our recorded history starts from 
when, for example, when the Portuguese in contact with the mm -hmm. Bini people, um, and from then on, it seems that everything that happened before then, we don't know. We just would literally yeah, stop I mean, in the dark. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> what happened My in right. Nigeria, in the place we call Nigeria, what happened there in 1380? Zero idea. You cannot, you know, we start to get ideas from 40, late 15th century, when, like you said, when the Portuguese came. And obviously, this was the Portuguese version, you know, so this was what they wrote. It was their own one sided version of the, yeah. the story. You know, you don't know what the other side was. In. And then you start to get things like maybe some slaves who had, you know, maybe who learned a language and then they start to tell you stories about what happened. You know, again, as much as that slave perspective is very, very important, we don't know. You know, we don't have a full picture, you know. So all of that stuff, I mean, it, it began in like, you know, late 15th century, you know, you start to get stories about what is going on and then, you know, all the slave, uh, but it, it, it's slave dominance, you know, and then maybe somebody traded. There was another part of my question that he had not answered. You know, I was saying from a, from a trajectory perspective, are we well past that point where, you know, we've missed the ship and, you know, we should have taken lessons from all those things that have happened if we had well ground, you know, well documented history or, or even if we did, are we still on the journey to maturity as a country? And I'm asking this because look, all the things that are pointing, if you look at the, the fall of the, the, the caliphates and, you know, even all the way down to this history, this, this issue of herdsmen, and, and you know, look at all of those things. These are things that if we had documented a lot of our history, we knew boundary lines, we knew how things shifted. We, we could have learned from, you know, how to take away a systemic problem by introducing sticks and carrots and, you know, you know using systems that work. Where are we as a country? Well, we are the, the, the bad news is that there's no mistake we cannot repeat in Nigeria. So even, <laughs> even, if, we, even if we know it, we can oh, make the oh. mistake, mistake over and over again. You know, but there, 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 but there are things that we can learn. You know, like I mentioned earlier, one of the things we don't seem to realize, you know, like if you look at the country now, if you take a pessimistic view, we are diving headlong into breakup. Now, there's a lot of assumption that people make that is funny to me in the sense that Oh, Southwest, we want to break out for that. And then somehow when we break out of the country, there'll be a Southwest. There is nothing in our <laughs> history. If you study our history, there's nothing in our history that should give you that kind of confidence. Yeah. Anytime something breaks up, it, it splinters. Yes. You know, yes. Or, your king, yes. or your empire broke up and it I, broke into pieces. You yeah. Know, people were there'll be further decisions. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so people, you know, people think that there is a lot of this is, is like, oh. Okay, you we we are Yoruba and all that kind of thing. So we we'll break up and then everybody go just because it's not going to work like that. You know, people are like I mentioned. There's this fierce streak of independence. Some people will now decide that hmm, okay, actually this is a good opportunity. There's chaos and everything. This is the time for us to say we don't want, we don't even want to be part of anybody. We just want to be, yeah. you know, one hundred thousand of us in our own country. We don't want to be part of. And then anybody. and then you, then you start having wars all over again. And then people, exactly. So this is kind of thing that you know. <laughs> This is the kind of thing that history should teach us, you know, but you can see that people are not, they're not paying attention to it. They're just, you know, mm. they, I mean, so again, because a lot of people have checked out of the future of Nigeria, yeah. they just assume that Nigeria is another person, and it's a dangerous thing, you know, they just assume that Nigeria is another yeah. person's problem, you know, and then we're just waiting for, you know, it, 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 it's, it is a debilitating state of things. Where Nigeria is Stanley's you, problem now from this uh, point. So once you feel that, once you, <laughs> once you feel Stanley's that, the only one in Nigeria now. <laughs> once you, if you feel that, if you feel that the country is not going anywhere, there'll be no Nigeria in 2040, you're not going to do anything today yeah. to try and Absolutely. Do it, you know, you are, you, you have washed my hands off it, you know, just, just sit down waiting for that to happen. So quick question, quick question for you. Um, and I know that you guys spent a lot of time uh, researching this book. So my question is this, what jumped out? What did you find shocking uh, researching this book? <laughs> there are lots, you know. So I, I'll say, just to use one example, I'll say that um, my opinion of Lugard and Flora Shaw moved in opposite directions. So initially, before this book, I, I kind of like 
I just took Lugana. I'm just ambivalent about it. I didn't think it was the devil that everyone kind of like painted him as that. You know, he just he was just yeah, doing his job. And then I had a very, very low opinion on Flora. Flora Show. You know, again, all these things you hear, the colored your view. Yeah. Kind of, but by the end, I my view of Lugano was a bit more negative than it was at the start. And, <laughs> at the, and, and then my view of Flora was a, a lot more positive. So I, I, I thought she was a wonderful woman. No surprise. She, 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 you know, you are known. You are known. <laughs> Man, like the, she, she, she loved the country. You know, she loved Nigeria. She worked hard to try and, you know, unfortunately, she couldn't stay long in the country because she was she was terribly sick and all that. But she was a passionate. She was passionate about Nigeria in a way that, you know, in today's modern, she's the kind of person who will become. A honorary Nigerian who will be going around wearing our traditional wear, that sort of thing. That's the kind of person she was. You know, and our history has really, really lowered her. They, you know, people just say Lugas girlfriend, Lugas girlfriend. No, no, no. She was a she was a an accomplished woman in her own, own right. The second person to be the editor of a major newspaper. At that point in time, it was almost unheard of yeah. in the UK. So the editor of a major in fact, she had to be signing her name as F Shaw, just so that people would not know that it was a woman. It was until mm-hmm. months later that people were like, ah, wow, that is, you know, and she knew all the important players in Nigeria and she used to bring them together. So Joseph Chamberlain, colonial secretary, obviously Lugard, yeah. and then all the other people, George Gould, she was one who kind of like brought in that, like, look, I'm fighting for what she thought was the best for Nigeria. And she wrote a book, you know, the, the, uh, um, a, a Tropical Dependency, which was, you know, very well received. People like it, very well received that when Aziki were ready, he said that, you know what, actually, that this book has convinced me even more that we should be independent, that what Flora has done here has shown that before now, we were we were able to run ourselves as independent kingdoms. That means we can do it again. That if Flora can go and research our history and say that, look, these people ran organized civilizations, you know, in different ways by themselves before any white man showed up, we can definitely do it again. So we yeah, are, you know, Pack your bags and be- One question. I don't I don't know what um what you guys are going to do next, but if you if you have the chance to pick one story of this book and write a whole book about it, what where what story will you pick? What history will you pick? On something <clears throat> yeah. One one section where you struggle to take materials off in order to be concise. Where, where yeah, I think for that we'll have a different answer. But I, for me personally, we didn't cover too much of Borno, uh, the mm-hmm. Borno Kingdom, the Canaan Borno Kingdom in the story. He was there. You know, we talked about El Kanemi, but El Kanemi was an amazing guy. You know, and and the Canaan Borno Kingdom they had their own different influences because they were you know they were they were facing. North Mediterranean, Africa, you know, the Mediterranean. So we didn't cover too much. I would have liked to, you know, we could probably expand on that definitely. And uh, just maybe like, so if we could find more stories about some ordinary people, one of the things we wanted to do was just find, you know, our history obviously, you know, is too strong man uh, celebrity. Uh, uh, celebrity. Uh, strong it's man, too celebrity heavy. <laughs> exactly, strong man centric, you know, but to be able to find, you know, just ordinary people who just did. Amazing things, you know. Amazing. Yeah, that would be that would be something that I'll definitely wish we could do more about. Okay, I personally, I my personal favorite is the Egbas, um, the story of the Egbas. That's, that's I, amazing. I think, yeah, yeah I think I think they I think they're a good testament to the fact that if you if you commit to building institutions from the foundation, mm-hmm. the benefits will that's be there for everyone. Great. Because like you like like the story goes, you know, there was economic prosperity. They, they approached. They approached all any problem they had with not with not with any sentiment, you know, no emotion that you know it was calculated. Pragmatism. It was pragmatic, pragmatic. it was pragmatic yeah. and essentially was a federal system. Mm-hmm. It was federalism. Yeah. So yeah. those are the things that jumped at me from, from the story. And of- you had a leader who was willing to share power. Yes. Which is, which is a very, very fundamental kind of thing. Even if you're in charge, you know, the willing to being willing to share power, that just takes away a lot of stress Absolutely. you know because you know at those in those days the only way to settle problem was fighting fight. so if you have somebody who who was willing to share power right from the start yeah. then you are a lot of fights would not happen okay. oh right okay um we don't want to keep you for the whole Faye, we don't want to keep you for the whole night Faye, do you guys plan to have like a like a documentary around this book 
Yeah, because, so people have people have asked. Some, some people have yeah. said that we should do something. We're, we're, we're thinking about it. Yeah, yeah definitely. We're open to it. We're open to it. Yeah. More more than just an audio book, you know, uh, putting putting things together. When you talked about this guy, the guy who was leading the tour at um, Badagri, Badagri yeah. I felt a personal resonance to that because when I went to Robben Island, um, the guy who took us round Robben Island, you know, believe it or not, was a prisoner on Robben Island at the time that Mandela was there. He was a much younger person, but he was there. And that's the first thing they tell you. They tell you his name. So actually, you could actually Google and you find that he was actually in prison at that time. So going into that island, you knew that you're going to hear it firsthand from someone who was there. And the guy just reading out dates, just just when he was speaking, and he could tell you this part of the prison, that part of the prison, this is where what happened in what year. And you know the whole story of Mandela having to the, the whole guys having to break rocks with their with their hands and with one, and then being shipped into the sea. I don't know if you've heard that story. That's what they made them do on the daily. They take them to the to the to the edge of the island. They take stones. They make them break the stones. Mm-hmm. And the whilst at the end of the day, you don't have from nine to six. By six thirty, in your very before, all those rocks were poured into the sea. Yeah, it's to crush your spirits. Yeah, it is to crush, crush your spirits. spirits. Exactly. But I'm saying that guy being able to show us all those things, you know, it shows that maybe as Africans, and this might be an African thing as well, we so much value, you know, oral history. But mm-hmm. it's good when it's backed up with something that doesn't change, a version that doesn't change. So yeah, the person exactly. is telling you from a version that doesn't change is not from their head, which is mm-hmm. something that can, then, that can then lose bits as it goes down the line. Mm-hmm. I think on the basis of that, that I am saying to you guys, you know, I'm not <laughs> I have the power to suggest, you know, but I'm just putting it out there that you we have we have things that of course you know is written is written. Mm-hmm. But building on that and you know adding that visual and adding that you know that that kind of storytelling to it might just you know. Yeah, definitely, might. definitely. I mean, a lot of people have mentioned and we're we're definitely open to it. So we'll see how it goes, but. You know, definitely it's, um, you know, the more mediums, the better, you know. Definitely. So, okay. Okay, I'm I'm fine, I'm fine. Sorry, sorry. (laughs) No problem. (laughs) As as the host, as the host, I'm taking over from here and I'm going to just finalize Mm. the questions. And just a few more uh, questions before you go. Um, Just, you know, this is something I I like to do, you know, when I speak to people like yourself. Um, So today you're the president of Nigeria. What is the one thing you're going to do? There's, There's no... This is just a, if just tell me just one single thing you're going to do. You're president of Nigeria. What's the single thing you'll do? Hey. Education. Education will be the thing I'll, I'll you know, basically bringing um, Nigerians up to a baseline, you know, an agreed baseline, saying basically, I want every Nigerian to be able to read and write, you know, you know, a, a baseline of education that just basically, you know, a basic education level, be able to read, write, and do mental, simple mental arithmetic, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, one of the stories we cover in the, in the book is the whole um, Clapham sector. But, and I've mentioned this on Twitter before that, you know, those first set of Nigerians who were rescued uh, slaves by the British oh. and taken to Freetown, Freetown you know, yeah. that got education, the way education has stuck in their fact, it's amazing. You will not find a descendant of any of those people today who does not have, who is an illiterate. It's amazing. You know, once the education touched the family, it stayed in. You know, and, and, I, and I, I think that in a country of 200 million people, forget whatever is on, on that, you know, I've been telling people like, like, we need to be able to move away from a resource because it does something to the brain when you believe that riches are under the ground. You just have to dig it up. And, you know, it's, it, rather than saying, looking at your human beings, and say, what can the human being do? You know, yeah. what is the potential of this human being? But you know, if you don't think in that way, you see somebody who is farming, the person is just a farmer, you cannot think of him as anything more than that. You see somebody who is a conductor, it's just a conductor. You cannot think of him. So, but we, to move to a human capital view of Nigeria, in the same that, what is the maximum we can get out of this human being? Forget anything else. You know, how can we bring this person up to a level where their potential can at least, 
you know, reach a baseline level. For me, so so for me, that would be the um, yeah. And it's not just education about sending people to university or something. You know, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, it, it, nobody it, it, in America. It's not that. Uh, they did not, Steve Jobs did not go to a university where they taught a course saying how to invent an iPhone or something or how to, yeah. W- yeah. most of the time, what a country knows, it's not really in universities. You know, after you've invented, somebody might then create a course as a whole, you know, but, but basically giving people an education that can allow them to, to express themselves, you know, to express themselves and to, you know, and just bring out that potential in people. The iPhones, whatever technology that is sitting inside of people, we want to, to give them an education to the point whereby those things can then uh, come out of them, you know. So fantastic. All right, okay. Um, a few more questions. Just um, first of all, so I, I one of the reasons I, I didn't quickly get this book. Sorry, I'm, I'm holding it upside down. Right for me. I didn't quickly get this book because I, I was hoping that it was going to come out in electronic form. Because I, I usually I've got so many books and I'm like, them. For those of you that know me, I've moved around a bit, so I'm kind of like wary of having too many physical books. Um, so do you have, are there plans for it to be in the Kindle form? Oh, it is, it is, yeah, this is on Kindle. Oh, it's on Kindle already? Yeah, okay. yeah, so if you go on Amazon, yeah, it's Kindle. It's oh, Kindle fantastic. I'm it, not it, came love out, with... uh, it came out late, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, because so. what I love with Kindle is that you can get real-time feedback. You know what it tells you? A thousand people have highlighted this, so you know yeah, you're yeah, the only yeah. one that, 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 that ministered to, in quotes. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's that, and then is there any plan for an audio format of this book as well? Yes, definitely. We are so. I mean, the, the publisher is handling everything. So, but yeah, okay. we. I think they've spoken to some narrators. I think it's one of the challenges in Nigeria. <laughs> narrating a book about Nigeria is that yeah, I wonder if one person can do it. Okay. So you want to get names right. Yeah. Pronounce, you know. So if you're going to give a Yoruba man to start pronouncing Lupe names and Igbo names and Niger Delta names, you know, things can go. So I think with the challenge of Nigeria is that maybe we might need more than one narrator, you know, so maybe a Hausa person who can actually give us the, you know, the proper pronunciation of Hausa names, and then maybe a Yoruba person can do, you know, that sort of thing. So I think, so I think that, that that's one of the challenges. It's not a, you know, we're, we're a multi-tongued yeah. nation. It's just our reality. So we have to account for that as well in doing an audio book. Okay. Right. Okay. Lastly, where can people reach you? If people need to, so on um, where where can they follow you and you know and sure. interact with you sure. generally? And where can they buy the book? Where can they also yeah. buy? Yeah. Sorry. It? So yes. So if you are in the UK, uh, Amazon is probably the best. The easiest one, just formation. Um, in Nigeria, Roving Heights, any of the main bookshops have it. You know, or you can also go to Cassava Republic's um, website. In America, North America, so Canada and the US is coming out uh, May eighteenth, thereabout. So you can pre-order though for in, in America at the moment, and then it will be delivered to you on, on that date. But yeah, so so that's that's pretty much it. You can I would recommend Amazon, you know, if you're in America or anywhere else, just go in there and then you yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that thank you for mentioning that, Stanley, because I also wanted to ask something personally. If one wanted to donate the they wanted to donate some copies to mm. like, is there any effort towards like things like donating to Libraries or stuff like that. If one, one, one is- yeah, some people did. Some people actually did that. You know, so we can arrange it with the publisher. So that will come through the publisher. I mean, where I mean, we've had people who have bought ball copies and given out, okay. and you know, somebody bought and gave to the university in Kogi as well. So yeah, definitely oh. I mean, reach out to me and we can. I was trying to do that actually. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. good because I'm from Kogi, obviously. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's great. Okay, so Twitter and uh, what's your Twitter handle? Just for I mean, we all know your Twitter handle, but yeah, D O U B L E E P H. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you so much, uh, for you for. Thanks for having me, guys. Those yeah, are yeah. Interesting yeah. Chat. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Um, thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Mondiu. Thank you, Wale, for joining us. Um, it's been a lovely evening. Um, bye for almost now from all of us. Bye. All right, guys. Bye.